Lucy Green and I'm here at the Kennedy Space Centre Visitor Complex standing in front of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Now Atlantis is one of the space shuttle fleet that NASA used to take humans and spacecraft into space over 30 years and I could tell you a bit about this piece of kit but actually it's better to hear from an expert so I've been joined by Chris Hadfield. Excellent. So Chris thank you for joining me. My pleasure, good to see you. And you have a very um, special and intimate connection with Personal. this spacecraft. This, this was the vehicle that I, I sat in on the launch pad here at the Kennedy Space Center. The engines lit uh, and eight and a half minutes later this magnificent ship had delivered myself and my crew to, uh, to orbit around the world. This was my first ride to space. Yeah, so it, uh, I look at Atlantis very fondly. I mean, it is a beautiful piece of kit. Um, but tell me, you must get asked all the time to give talks about the space shuttles. Sure. So I wanted to understand a bit about how the space shuttle sits in the psyche of America. I mean, it must hold a really special place in people's hearts. I grew up with the space shuttle in my space science career, so it's very yeah. special to me. Tell me a bit about what, what the perception is. Well, it's been the great lifter of humanity to space so far. About two thirds of everybody who's been to space flew on board this or one of her sisters. So it has that, that place in human history, the great first big human lifting vehicle. But also it defined a couple generations of American capability, kind of the pinnacle of everything. Let's not just build a little capsule that takes one or two people for a very short period. Let's build a big truck that can be used over and over again and push our technology to the limit. And not only did it, did it help uh, push the very edges of the envelope of how you can get to space, but it also became very iconic. You know, that there'd be a shuttle launch this morning and half a million people would come to the Kennedy Space Center and the cameras would all turn and the, there's almost a great uh, triumphant feel. I imagine it's how the Egyptians felt when they looked at a pyramid or, or whatever, mm -hmm. that, that human capability to do something that otherwise could never happen. And the shuttle, in sort of its big ponderousness, also had a great elegance and beauty to it. And it, it defined a self-image for a lot of people of what humans can do when they work together hard, specifically, of course, uh, for the nation that invented it, the Americans. And I always feel that with space shuttles, because you have a reusable fleet, they're named, that also kind of gives this connection. People feel like they know the shuttles, they know the missions they went on, they know the astronauts who flew on them. Do you think that made a difference? I, uh, I've been so grateful my whole life to have operated a lot of different types of vehicles. I, I was a pilot and a fighter pilot and a, and a, and a test pilot. And so there's almost a, uh, if the vehicle is good enough, like a horse, you, you or even a really beloved car, you sort of name it and it becomes, <laughs> it becomes uh, another living being for you. These, because so many crews flew them, this flew dozens of times, it, it became a much beloved beast. Not just a, uh, a thing, but uh, you know, ships are named and, and called she, you know, because, because we give them sort of a personality. And this magnificent human creation uh, I mean, after I landed, I wanted to get out and kiss it mm. just because it, it had done something so exquisitely mm. hard and done it so well. I flew this for uh, millions of miles and in an incredibly hostile environment. And we launched out of here and landed back here. And after all of that, the only problem we had with this whole vehicle was one of the light bulbs was burned out in the flight <sighs> deck of the cockpit. Everything else worked perfectly. And there must be millions oh, of components the, in It's this so case. incredibly complex and so... Um, heinously dangerous and yet this thing delivered us through all that uh, through the human ingenuity of design and construction the enormous maintenance that happens here at the Kennedy Space Center and the real-time support through the Johnson Space Center in Houston and, and the teams around the world but also just through the the beautiful rugged design of the ship itself so yeah it's uh, it was iconic for for people to look at a great focal point of pride but for the crew this this was the mothership that allowed us to go do those magical things. I, I love this vehicle. I want to think a bit about um, the design of the shuttle. So it's iconic for its shape. It could be used as a glider. It has wings. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask sort of fundamentally about that design. Sure. It's so different from what came before with the Apollo program. Did it offer a unique opportunity having that design? Or has NASA learned actually that's not really the way to go? The space shuttle was designed originally in the 60s and early 70s for a specific purpose, and that was to put a huge spy satellite in the back 
to launch out of uh, the United States and go straight north so that you could go around the world in 45 minutes and then on the other side of the world use that huge camera to take pictures of some place that was doing something that was a threat to the United States and then as you came around the world again then have enough capability even though the world had turned in those 92 minutes to be able to then get back to your runway and land so a very short flight launch take a bunch of pictures fly sideways and land that means a couple things one you have to be able to land with a great big 60s technology heavy telescope in the back so you need wings and wheels the other is um, you have to be able to correct for the earth turning underneath you so you've got to be able to sort of fly sideways a long way so that's why the shuttle had wings it was to be able to land with a huge telescope in the back and be able to have what we call cross range to be able mm. to fly several hundred miles uh, off of your regular track to get back over to where your runway is now. We never did those missions with the shuttle. We, we it never ended up doing that. That wasn't how the technology advanced. We ended up doing so many other things with the shuttle. But that's what fixed this design. The size of the cargo bay and the capability of the wings and the size of that tail on the back. It was all designed for a purpose that never actually came to be. Um, and what we learned from it was that does give you great added capability, but at a significant cost. Wings are complicated and heavy, and you don't use them until you're coming back to land. They were useless during launch. They were just a liability while you were in orbit. Uh, their weight, their mass, they, the meteorites hit them. They're fragile, as happened, and killed the crew of Columbia. So mm -hmm. there's a huge trade-off between that. And I think what we really learned was you shouldn't transport the crew with the cargo. Like if you drive down a motorway, there's the great big lorries carrying cargo, and then there's all the other vehicles carrying people. And we hardly ever do both in the same vehicle. Mm. It's just not efficient. So that's what we've sort of learned in space. We're going to, I think in the future, use uh, unmanned rockets to carry all the cargo, and we'll use specially designed, much safer and more robust uh, capsules and, and gumdrop shaped things to carry people. The shuttle was magnificent, but like all uh, complexity, it comes at a level of, of cost and, and decrease in, in safety. And um, it, was, it was a great thing to fly on, but I, I don't think we'll build shuttles in the future. It was the wrong compromise we learned. So you really captured a moment in space exploration that will probably not come again. Yeah, the, like all things, there's a rise and a fall, mm. in, both in societies and in technologies. I mean, you could go back to almost any technology, you know, the steam-powered car or the, uh, whatever, the biplane or uh, the uh, cathode ray tube television. They were, they were the best thing yeah. going when they came out. But new technologies yeah. come along. We learn, we find better ways to manufacture, yeah. and, and those things sort of go on to the, the technological dust heap of history. Yeah. But I'm glad that I was alive during yeah. this era because this was a great thing to fly. <laughs> I like your analogy there. And I remember when the shuttles retired, I was doing some um, interviews in the media about it. And I referred to it exactly as you did. I talked about retiring a classic car yeah. and going forward with the next step in um, uh, human space exploration with the new technology. Classic car owners in the UK got very unhappy with me when yeah. I said that, but it is that analogy, isn't it? You need to keep looking at the, at the engineering and where to go next. So t tell me a bit about what NASA is doing next, because we're at this really interesting point in space exploration now, where you've got the commercial side perhaps picking up what NASA once used to do to get into low Earth orbit, um, but we are, or NASA is, working on new technology to get humans back into space again. Sure. One of, one of the great legacies that NASA has left the world is a much deeper understanding of spaceflight, of the risks, of the technologies. How do you build a rocket that'll work? How do you navigate when you're in space? What can you make the materials out of to safely re-enter into the atmosphere? That information is available basically to everybody on Earth now. And since we designed and flew this thing, computers have gotten so <laughs> small. Our, yeah. our decision making has gotten uh, very portable. Uh, our understanding of hypersonic aerodynamics, we've built the global positioning system. So our navigation systems have gotten super accurate. When you take all of that cumulative uh, information and, and hard earned knowledge, um, you can do way better. And, and private companies now 
can take advantage of that vast bulwark of almost 100 years of history and now apply it to make a much more efficient sh uh, vehicle than the space shuttle. And that's the way it ought to be. So NASA has, has done its job in that area and is now, of course, focusing on the other stuff that isn't yet profitable. Um, really high orbits around the world or, of course, started to explore the rest of the universe with robots and with people. Are we at the stage in history now where our spaceships are good enough that we can start not just going to the moon and showing we can get there and planting a flag and doing basic science, but starting to live there, mm -hmm. starting to settle somewhere else? Seems impossible, but that's how settlement has happened on the surface of the Earth. I mean, the first person of the South Pole was 1911, and now thousands of people live in Antarctica because our technology's gotten better. So NASA is able now to focus uh, and hand over some of the now more mundane activities to commercial partners and, and private entities and, and really get on with the business of you know, National Aeronautics and Space Administration looking out into space and, and seeing what else they can do to help further the edge of, of exploration and push back the, uh, the, the fringes of ignorance. <laughs> and the Lunar Gateway will be the next big step and that will be in collaboration with the European Space Agency too. Uh, many space agencies of the world are continuing to build on what we did with the shuttle, which was built by you know European Space Agency and the Canadians and the Americans, all three together, predominantly NASA, but, but Canada built the Canada Arm and the Europeans built uh, some of the big uh, laboratories that went in the back. Those led to the International Space Station, which is 15 nations together. And we've, we've built such a capable international structure for space exploration that it makes sense to use that to go forwards uh, to the moon is the next destination eventually to mars and beyond and so learning from all this to build something orbiting around the moon to build things on the surface of the moon how we're going to uh, make all the hardware fit together whose uh, rules are we going to follow whose laws will apply on the moon all of that needs to be sorted out collectively by the whole planet and it's the legacy starting with gagarin and and uh, al shepard through the whole shuttle era, International Space Station era, that has sort of laid the framework for where we're headed next and how collectively we can do it as a species. And, and I think we've done a magnificent job, imperfect, mm -hmm. but done a magnificent job of doing it. And, and I'm really excited about where it's taking us next. Yeah, uh, me too. And I, the Lunar Gateway is so appealing because it would give us that opportunity to be dropping down to the surface of the moon regularly. You'd have your space station, it would make the whole process more efficient, wouldn't it? It gives the capability to have people and hardware in a safe haven around the moon so that uh, you don't, everything that goes to the moon doesn't have to have a lander. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got parallels on Earth. You know, you have the big delivery train coming into town, but then there's all the little vehicles that take things off that train and deliver it to all the businesses around, around the city. You know, that, that type of, of model makes sense depending on the long-term ecosystem of the Earth and the Moon together. And that's, that's sort of where they're headed. Plus, if you're looking to cooperate internationally over a slow-growing program, you need legacy benchmark programs that will allow you to do those things together. If you're just yeah. trying to put something on the surface of the Moon, then you can maybe do it more efficient. But to make the Moon part of a big ecological Earth-Moon system, what we're doing makes a lot of sense. Great. So I think now it just falls to me to say thank you so much, Chris. We Thanks. need to open the doors to this wonderful facility and let the public in. So it's been great to hear your stories and um, thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, I will come and talk uh, next to Atlantis anytime you want to, Lucy. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Thank Thanks you. very much. <laughs> Well, thank you for watching and thanks to Chris Hadfield for joining us here. Also, we have to thank NASA and the Kennedy Space Centre for giving us access to this amazing piece of kit. So subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and also if you want to find out about the mathematics of space exploration, you can watch the videos yes. of Matt Parker. I have got the mass covered, so as well <laughs> as the videos here on the Cosmic Shambles Network, you can go to my Stand Up Mass videos, we'll link below and check out all the mathematics.